The Terran Kilrothi War by 2667 had taken a turn for the worse. Despite the securing of the Enigma Sector, the Kilrothi had pressed hard on Confederation forces, destroying a third of their active carrier fleet. Faced with a severe lack of force projection due to the sudden depletion of their frontline carriers, the Admiralty of the Terran Confederation comes up with a desperate plan to address this tactical and logistical nightmare. Nine medium transports, currently under construction at the time, would be militarized and retrofitted with carrier decks to conduct flight operations for their fighter craft. This new paradigm in shipbuilding would be christened the Wake class. Unlike the Yorktown, Bengal, and Confederation classes, who range from light carriers to dreadnoughts, the Wake was designated as an escort carrier, made for convoy protection duties, fighter transport, aerospace support, and the role she would inevitably be best known for, high-risk deep strike assaults. The names of the original nine wake carriers are somewhat uncertain, as throughout their service history, a total of ten ships have been described, with little indication as to when they were commissioned. Due to this unresolved issue, all ten ships will be listed here instead of nine, starting with the Wake, the Iwo Jima, the Saipan, the Sevastopol, the Corsan, the Normandy, no, not that one, the Crete, the Gallipoli, the Enigma, and our subject for analysis today, the Tarawa. When it comes to hard numbers, no such information exists for the most part. But from their origins as transports, there are some aspects of the weight class in the Tarawa that we can make rough estimates on. The first is length. The only known canonical transport ship that could possibly be retrofitted to an escort carrier would be the Clarkson class, at 160 meters. Taking into account the additional structures added on to perform carrier operations, a ballpark estimate to a typical wake's length could vary anywhere from 160 meters to 720 meters. 720 meters is defined as the uppermost limit here due to the length of the Yorktown Light Carrier class being 720, and the fact that escort carriers throughout Earth history, particularly during the Second World War where they originally debuted, have been the smallest ships in the carrier role. Speed and maneuverability, on the other hand, have more definite numbers. The Tarawa herself was outfitted with the same engine system that the Gilgamesh class destroyers had, which was able to push her speed to 247 kilometers per second, which was impressive considering that the Tarawa was presumably heavier than a destroyer, and the fact that the Gilgameshes had a top speed of only a few kps higher at 250 kilometers per hour. As the Tarawa's top speed was just short of the Gilgamesh destroyers, we can make similar estimates as to her maximum yaw, pitch, and roll, which would most likely range between 1 to 2 degrees per second. It was unknown if the other weight carriers had the Gilgamesh engines as it was never directly stated, but the most likely answer would be that they were. While escort carriers were designed to be cheap, a certain threshold of survivability for the ship and her crew would have had to have been reached by confed engineers. When it comes to shielding, the Tarawa entered the war when phase shields would have been implemented on all Kilrathi and Terran capital ships. Phase shields were designed to be impervious against energy blasts and munitions from fighter craft, requiring the use of bombers with anti-cap ship torpedoes. As such, no publicly listed numbers for shield strength were ever listed as they could not be overcome by fighter-level weaponry until after the false armistice. Her armor, on the other hand, have no concrete numbers in regards to strength. Again, if we look to the history of the escort carrier class, her armor strength would almost certainly be rated below that of a light carrier, but higher than that of the transport class she was built on top of. In terms of armament, the Tarawa had two mass driver cannons located at the bow to the port and starboard of the approach deck. Also on the forward bow, top side, was a heavy quad-barreled neutron gun. Exact numbers as to her laser turrets and missile launchers are unknown. But when Jason Bear Bondarevsky was en route to his assignment as Wing Commander of the Tarawa for the first time, he noticed there were two more beam weapons, most likely laser turrets, and several missile launchers along the bottom. But the most important feature of any carrier regardless of size is her ability to launch and retrieve strike craft. Her fighter complement during the end run was 42 craft, divided into three squadrons. The first of which being Blue Squadron flying F-44C Rapiers, Green Squadron F-57 Sabre Fighter Bombers, and Red Squadron piloting ferrets for reconnaissance work. Unfortunately, exact numbers as to how the fighter complement was divided between the three squadrons is unknown. Due to the size limitations of the hangar deck, most probably due to the retrofitted design, 
The workhorse bomber of the Terran Confederation, the Broadsword, was too large to be stored in her hangar space. Instead, anti-cap ship operations would be dependent on the Tarawa's complement of sabers outfitted with torpedoes. When the Tarawa would fully become a member of the Landreich Navy after the Kilrathi War, her complement was divided into three to five squadrons. The Flying Eyes and Hornets, the Crazy Eights Flying Raptors, and the Liberators, also in Raptors. Rapiers and scimitars have been seen flying with the Independence during both Project Goliath and the Third Battle of Hellhole respectively. However, no squadron name can be determined for either. Also, the rapiers may have been from one of the other escort ships during Project Goliath. The exact number of planes the Tarawa had as a full member of the Landreich Navy had never been stated explicitly. However, using numbers gained from casualty reports both during and after the Third Battle of Hellhole, the Independents had anywhere between 33 to 42 fighters. The service history of the Tarawa would go on to be quite distinguished, despite her origins as part of a stopgap measure to bolster the ranks of the Terran carrier fleet. The first historically significant role the Tarawa played was in Strike Force Valkyrie, as part of Admiral Bainbridge's high-risk plan to divide the Kilrathi fleet and cause as much damage to their numbers and military infrastructure as possible. Dubbed End Run by the general populace after the fact, the Tarawa, along with the Venture Corvette, the Kagimasha, and a destroyer, the Intrepid, were tasked with infiltrating into Kilra and destroying as much of their manufacturing and war material as possible. Trying to fully summarize the events of this end run would simply not do it justice here. But the general bullet points was that the Tarawa, her fighters, and her escorts were able to critically damage the manufacturing centers and in development ships surrounding Kilra as well as exposing a fundamental weakness in Kilrathi logistics and support that Confed would continue to exploit using the new wake carriers. The Tarawa and her sisters proved to be so successful in the deep strike role over the next 18 months after the end run that they were able to weaken the Kilrathi Empire to the point where they were almost on the verge of losing the war. This change in fortune would lead to the False Armistice, an event previously documented on this channel. The Tarawa and four other carriers were sent to the Landreich to prevent their decommissioning during the temporary peace, and to keep them in service to investigate reports of a Kilrathi military buildup on the far side of their empire. The Tarawa, along with one of her sisters, the Normandy, and the Bannockburn, a stealth light freighter under command of James Paladin Taggart, infiltrated deep into Kilrathi space and confirmed Confed's worst fears with the discovery of the Hakaga fleet. The Tarawa would play a role again during the False Armistice incident, when she and the Landreich fleet arrived in Seoul at the 11th hour to save Earth from total destruction during the Battle of Earth. Sometime shortly after the war ended, the Tarawa was sold back into Landreich hands after she was crippled in the last days of the Terran Kilrathi War. After being refitted, the Tarawa would begin life anew and be rechristened the FRLS Independence, the flagship of the Landreich fleet a fitting honor for such a distinguished ship, but she would not spend the rest of her days being a showpiece for the frontier worlds. No, the Landreich space was about to ignite into a new conflict following the end of the war. A neighboring Kilrathi warlord had been building his fleets for an attack on Terran space, in order to carve out a new empire for himself. However, in a stroke of luck for the Terrans, Landreich scouts had detected a derelict Bondkara-class supercarrier in a remote system called Vaku. Realizing the tactical potential of the Bondkara, and hoping to ensure the security of his people, President Max Kruger ordered a salvage operation in which the Independents, along with Kevin Tolwyn, Jeffrey Tolwyn, Vance Richards, and Jason Bondarevsky, oversaw the protection and refitting of the Landreich Navy's new prize. Once the Bondkara was restored to operational capacity, the Independents would go on to see action at the Third Battle of Hellhole, fighting alongside a pirate group known as the Guild against an overwhelming Kilrathi attack. Afterwards, she and the Landreich carrier fleet would arrive at the 11th hour at the Battle of Bakakar, where the Independents and her comrades in arms outmaneuvered Baron Yukardai Ragark's fleet, forcing them into a retreat. Again, as with the events of Enrun, this story will also need to be covered in a separate video to appropriately capture its events. Born of a dark time in the Terran Kilrathi War, the Tarawa would join other legendary ships such as the Victory and Tiger's Claw in embodying the tenacity and courage of the Terran Confederation. She may never have been intended to be as glorious as a Vesuvius or a Midway, 
but through her valorous deeds, the Tarwan nevertheless captured the hearts and minds of the people she fought to protect. <laughs>